end of the age of Aquarius, motion 312, and universal human equality. My name is Hannah, and I am the president of UW Students for Life here on campus. Uh, as a club, we work to support women who are dealing with unplanned pregnancies and women who are post-abortive. We advocate for the precious lives of the preborn. We work to form future leaders in the pro-life movement, and we work to educate the University of Waterloo students and faculty about life issues. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone in the room to be respectful and quiet during Mr. Woodward's presentation. There will be time for questions after he has finished speaking. If there are any disturbances during Mr. Woodward's presentation, they will be handled by campus police. Disturbances include, but are not limited to, loud speaking and noises that disrupt others from hearing, large signs that are obstructing the view of others, and violence. If you are in this room tonight for the sole purpose of being disrespectful and distracting, please do the right thing and leave the room now. If you choose not to do so now, you will be later removed by police services. Thank you for your cooperation, and without further ado, I present Mr. Wilson. Good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, I'm really happy to be here tonight, and I hope that you are too. And uh, there's a very good reason uh, why we should be happy to be here tonight. Uh, and that is because history is on the side of justice and human rights. And I know that uh, everyone in this room is on the side of justice and human rights. And that means that uh, you and I are on the side of history. And that ought to give us good reason for optimism and hope. Uh, and a uh, good reason to be happy about being here tonight. I want to also begin by extending a great big thanks to the University of Waterloo. You know, uh, in our society, uh, for a long time, we have valued freedom of speech and freedom of assembly, and we consider those to be important uh, democratic principles uh, which really have to be satisfied in order for us to uh, carry on a respectful dialogue. And I know that those are principles that the University of Waterloo honors, and it's really in honor of those principles uh, that uh, they have assisted us in having this event tonight. And it's really to honor those principles of freedom of assembly and freedom of speech uh, that I wouldn't rest without coming back here to the University of Waterloo. Uh, as you know, uh, there was an unhappy previous occasion uh, when uh, it was impossible uh, to speak, when freedom of speech uh, here was uh, denied. Uh, and the only response that I think is appropriate when you come up against uh, those who would deny freedom of speech, who would deny democratic values, is to persist, to stand up for those democratic values. Uh, and uh, it would have been, uh, in my opinion, uh, the wrong thing to do uh, not to come back and not to have the opportunity to uh, address you. Now, uh, having said that, uh, I, I'm not going to repeat uh, everything that I started to say the last time that I was here, uh, with maybe one exception. And for those who were here uh, before or have heard me speak elsewhere, uh, I just want to begin uh, by explaining that I regard an event like this as a real exchange of gifts. Honestly, I can't tell you how grateful I am that you are giving me your time and attention and listening to uh, what I have to say. Uh, that's a gift that I don't underestimate in any way. And the only gift that I can give in return is the gift of some understanding and some ideas that you might find uh, useful and thought-provoking. Now, whenever I say that, I am reminded of the story of the two fellows uh, who were uh, experimenting in the early days of aviation with ballooning. Forgive me those of you who have heard this story, but uh, it's a good reminder to me. And they were not sure how to control this thing. It was new technology. And sure enough, after a while, they lost control. And they began to drift. And they looked down. And there wasn't a mountain or a lake or anything they recognized. But they did see a fellow walking along a path. So they lowered a little further. And they hollered down to him, where are we? And he thought about it for a minute and scratched his head. And finally, he hollered back, you're up in a balloon. 
And as they floated away, the one fellow turned to the other and he said, you know, that guy must have been a lawyer because everything he said was perfectly true, but also totally useless. <laughs> now, the non-lawyers in the crowd should never tell a joke like that, but I, I practiced law for almost 30 years, so I'm permitted. And it's a reminder to me that I don't want my remarks to be useless to you. I want them to be useful. And in that uh, light, uh, at the end of my presentation, uh, with luck, uh, if there is time and you can stay, we can have some question and answer and, and exchange and dialogue. Now, uh, there are uh, two things that I will tell you at the outset just to catch your attention, which uh, might shock you, uh, because I know that this is a group of people who consider themselves to be uh, pro-life. So I want to tell you two things that might shock you. Uh, that I'm going to talk about tonight. And I don't want you to be too shocked because I am going to explain my meaning to you as I proceed. But the first thing I want to tell you is that there are actually some issues in Canada today. There is an issue in Canada today which is more important than abortion. And believe me, I, believe me, I know how important the issue of abortion is. Uh, and uh, I feel uh, I have strong feelings about abortion, but in spite of that, I want to tell you that there is an issue that is more important in Canada today than the issue of abortion, and I'll explain that in a moment. The second thing I want to tell you uh, that you might find shocking is that over the course of my time in Parliament, I've come to realize that there really is such a thing as magic. Uh, there really is a kind of a, a mass hypnosis. Uh, words carry magical weight, uh, almost like incantations. Uh, and again, don't be too shocked by that. Uh, I will uh, expand on that as I go. So I'm really going to go back and uh, relate to you uh, some insights into Motion 312, which, as you may know, was defeated in the Parliament of Canada last year. The reason that I'm still talking about it is because it was somewhat misrepresented uh, by those who opposed it, and uh, the press uh, picked up on their uh, representation more than mine. And it's such an important issue that we have to get it right, and so I'm still uh, promoting the idea behind Motion 312. And the question is, if Motion 312 was not about abortion, and if subsection 223, which was the subject matter of Motion 312, was not about abortion, then what was Motion 312 about? And Motion 312 was about the idea that we should enshrine in Canadian law the inherent worth and dignity and equality of every human being. That's what Motion 312 was about an issue much more important uh, than abortion because it affects our whole political system, our whole system of justice. Uh, now, uh, subsection 223 was the example that I used to illustrate this problem in Canada. And uh, perhaps we could just turn to the next uh, slide and I'll mention that the subtitle of this is what uh, Hannah said earlier, the end of the age of Aquarius. I may be one of the oldest people in this room, uh, and uh, so, uh, and, and contrary to what is said, uh, I do remember the 60s, and I was there, uh, and uh, we had a, an anthem, a theme song called the age of Aquarius, which I will return to in a moment. Uh, and you'll understand why I am talking about the end of the age of Aquarius in Canada. If I could have the next slide, uh, and the one after it. This is subsection 223, which I hope by now everybody in Canada knows about. Uh, before I started, 79% of Canadians were not aware of this. Before I started with Motion 312, I would like to think uh, that my efforts in relation to Motion 312 have uh, reduced that level of unawareness to at least 50%. Uh, but uh, this is key to what I'm speaking about. A child becomes a human being within the meaning of this act uh, when the child has completely proceeded in a living state from the body of the mother, whether or not it has breathed, has a severed navel cord, or independent circulation. Now, 
don't be fooled by the words within the meaning of this act because this is a written form of a common law principle which finds its way throughout many aspects of Canadian law. And think about uh, what it means. What we're saying here is that a child is not a human being until the last part of the child's body leaves the mother's body. Does anyone really believe that? Believe that there is a magical moment of transformation when a child uh, transforms from a non-human entity into a human being. Uh, I've had nurses uh, tell me that they've uh, witnessed childbirth and found that there are some children who actually begin to cry while they are still not fully out of the birth canal. Clearly they're breathing and uh, they are crying. But in Canada, thanks to this 400 year old definition of human being, those children are not uh, legally recognized as human beings in Canada. So think about the implication of that. This is the state saying that someone we know is a human being, in fact a human being, is going to be falsely condemned as non-human, falsely designated as non-human. The issue is, should the state, for any reason, have the authority to designate falsely any human being as non-human without regard to their actual nature as a human being? That's the issue. And it just so happens uh, that this uh, particular example of it deals with children before birth. Uh, but I can tell you that there are a whole slew of academics, beginning with Peter Singer and Alberto Giubilini, and, uh, or rather Minerva Giubilini, uh, Al, um, I forget the Alberto's last name, but there are a whole slew of academics who wish to apply this principle beyond children before birth to other categories. If the state can falsely designate as non-human someone who is in fact a human being, it's a kind of tyranny. And the categories of victim are never closed to tyranny. So uh, that's the context uh, which I want to uh, introduce to you. And when I started, the very first thing I said to the journalists when I introduced Motion 312 was, was this. I said, never accept any law that says someone you know to be a human being is not a human being. It seemed sort of self-evident to me, to be honest with you. That was partly my downfall, in a way, because I thought that was self-evident. Uh, to me, a law which says someone I know to be human is not human is a savage and inhumane law, a throwback to a more barbarous era. But you know what? When I said that, I got a question from the journalists. They said to me, why? Why is that important? I was kind of taken aback because it seemed self-evident to me that it's an important principle that the state cannot falsely designate someone as non-human who we know to be human. But that was the question. Why, is that, why are you worried about that, Woodworth? What difference does it make if we give the state power to do that? So. I remember very well the first time that question was put to me and uh, I said the first thing that came into my head, which was something that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said many years ago, and he said, uh, an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And surely it's an injustice for the state to falsely designate someone as non-human who we know to be human. And an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And what, what the good doctor was trying to say is that the thread, the tapestry of our system of laws and justice uh, is uh, all uh, woven together. And if you pull a thread out, the whole thing begins to disintegrate. Or in another way that I put it, a 400 year old law which says that someone who is human is not human it's like having a 400-year-old sofa with 400-year-old straw sitting in your front room smelling up the whole house of Canadian justice. Now, to my surprise, 
the journalists that I were, was speaking to were not nearly so inspired by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as I was. And they didn't seem to want to accept that as uh, the answer about why I thought uh, this law should be examined. And by the way, I was only proposing to examine it, to study it, nothing more. So perhaps I should have said this. Perhaps I should have said that recognition of the e equal worth and dignity of every member of the human family is the foundation for freedom, peace, and justice in the world. Those are stirring words to me. Those are words from the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And what they are saying is that every human being possesses equal worth and dignity. And that equal worth and dignity must, in a civilized democracy, be recognized in law. The state can neither take away nor grant the worth and dignity that each individual has as a human being. And sometimes we talk about the inalienable rights and inherent rights. What we are saying in the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights is that that's who you are. It is not something the government gives or takes away. Now, I didn't uh, think about saying that early on, but eventually in the course of uh, presenting Motion 312, I did come to that and uh, try to share it with people, and as I share it with you today. So I had to ask myself, why the heck was I surprised? Why wasn't I prepared for the question of, of why it's important that there should never be a law which falsely condemns someone as non-human who we know to be human? Why did that take me by surprise that not everybody uh, realized that? And, and I thought about it, uh, and uh, I, I realized it might be because of the times that I, I grew up in. And I started thinking about this, and uh, I'm not shy. I'll tell you I was born in 1954. That's just nine years after the end of the Second World War, where my father uh, enlisted and went to fight to defeat an ideology, one of the chief characteristics of which was the willingness of a government to deny the equal worth and dignity of some human beings. That was very fresh in everyone's mind uh, when I was born. In fact, uh, you know, I, I'm old enough, I sometimes joke with younger audiences about the fact that a lot of the events that I lived through are now considered historical events. Uh, but, but think about this, I was born less than a hundred years after the United States abolished slavery. And th there was another example of laws which denied the equal worth and dignity of some human beings. In fact, the US Supreme Court in around 1857 in the Dred Scott decision ruled that under American law, African Americans could not uh, buy or sell property because they themselves were in fact property. Nine highly educated, civilized, religious men on the US Supreme Court. And it was less than 100 years after that that I was born. I was born less than 40 years after women were first recognized in Canadian law as persons. That was, uh, that's a famous case. And the uh, Supreme Court of Canada, nine, again, nine highly educated, civilized men, uh, ruled that uh, women would not be counted as persons. Now, whether you say someone's not a person or whether you say someone's not a human being, the end object of that is to deny that they have equal worth and dignity. And thank goodness the Privy Council in Great Britain overturned the Canadian Supreme Court and ruled that women did possess equal worth and dignity. And you know, if you go back and study that, you will find some of the most terrible and strangest arguments that were put forward to explain why women didn't possess equal worth and dignity to men right from the size of the brain through other things. Uh, there are always reasons that tyranny can find to justify its position. In fact, I once did a, a paper for myself, and it never published, on, on how it is that the United States could, in the middle of the 19th century, 
have a law which said that African Americans did not possess equal worth and dignity. There were lots of justifications, right from uh, divine right of whites to uh, economic arguments. Tyranny will always find justification for such laws. I was born less than six years after that United Nations Declaration of Human Rights that I mentioned to you. I grew up in the late 1950s and early 1960s when the U.S. Civil Rights Movement was at its height. And people like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. energized me and, and really inspired me with the notion that every human being must legally be recognized as possessing equal worth and dignity. I was 13 years old when Australia first began counting aboriginals as part of the human population of Australia. Amazing to think that in 1967 in an advanced Western democracy, their old outdated uh, constitution did not account aboriginals as part of the human population of Australia. And I was 13 years old. So I lived and breathed this when I was growing up. I should add, I was thinking about this, my mother passed away last year, and, and remembering back over times with her, she used to sit around the kitchen table with the newspaper and, and relate to me the news articles of the day. And uh, very often her refrain was, was, to, uh, was to sadly uh, comment on, uh, her phrase was, man's inhumanity to man. I don't know if there's anybody else my age who remembers that phrase as being somewhat common uh, when, when we were growing up. Man's inhumanity to man. So the notion that we should never falsely condemn someone as non-human who we know in fact to be human just goes against everything that I was ever taught. And I remember saying that when I was asked this question repeatedly, why are you concerned about this? I said, look, I, I grew up in the 60s and I down to my toes believe this is wrong, but that somehow didn't come through. So I'm giving you just a, a little bit more of the kind of atmosphere. And, and I mentioned uh, the age of Aquarius. Well, it was a very optimistic time for young people. Uh, we believed uh, that we were on the threshold of, a, of an age where, in fact, everyone would be treated with equal worth and dignity. And the anthem of that was the age of Aquarius, Aquarius being the astrological sign. And when things are properly aligned, it would be uh, sympathy and understanding. Peace would rule the planets. Love would guide the stars. That's the ethic that I grew up with. And if you had told me in 1967 that I would one day inhabit a Canada where the Parliament of Canada would shelter a law that denies that principle, that every human being possesses equal worth and dignity, I would have said, go away, you're crazy. It'll never happen. Well, sad to say, all of that which I felt uh, to be self-evident, uh, I had trouble explaining uh, to some people uh, when I presented uh, Motion 312. This has an even more Canadian twist, if I may, because Canada is the result of the promise that two founding nations in conflict could reconcile their differences peaceably. And generations of Canadians have lived and died to defend the ideal of human equality, universal human rights, honest laws that are necessary to fulfill that promise. And that has made Canada uh, able to create unity out of diversity. It's made Canada a beacon around the world and it's brought ever greater recognition of the inherent worth and dignity of every human being. I truly believe that notion anchors Canada's bedrock character. I'll explain what I mean. Uh, when the uh, British ultimately conquered the French in Canada, after, after having first uh, crushed and expelled the Acadians uh, early in, uh, I guess, the 1750s, my history on that's not too complete, but by 1760, when the British finally won the last battle, they said to the French Canadians, you may keep your language. You may keep your religion. You may keep your culture. 
we will coexist with you. Now it's too bad they didn't extend that to First Nations and uh, you know some others perhaps, but, but the reality is you can't coexist with someone on the basis of inequality. It would make no sense to say to the French Canadians, uh, you can keep your uh, culture, your religion, your language, but then say that yeah, doesn't matter, the British are gonna be more equal than you, you know? So in a way you can say that this notion of universal equality and respectful dialogue and democratic ideals is built into the DNA of Canada. When the Privy Council uh, did finally rule that women should be recognized as persons with equal worth and dignity to men in Canada, uh, they said that the law that uh, they were throwing out was a relic of more barbarous times. And perhaps I should have been that harsh when I introduced Motion 312. I wasn't. I tried to take a more positive, uplifting tone. But the reality is that law is a relic of a more barbarous times. You know what else they said? When they were asked, they were asked the same question. It's really quite eerie if you go back through the decision. They were asked, why should we recognize women as persons? You know what they said? They said the real question is why should we decree that women are not persons? And I should have said the same thing perhaps. Why should we have a law which decrees that someone is not a human being when we know otherwise? So I came up with an answer eventually about why it is that uh, this principle, which seemed self-evident to me, was not uh, self-evident to everyone. Uh, and um, the answer is one of those uh, incantation words that I spoke to you about earlier. And the word is abortion. Now, nothing that I've told you has anything to do with abortion. It's not about abortion. Abortion has to do with trying to reconcile the rights of a mother with the rights of an unborn child. And our law does that in all kinds of circumstances for all kinds of people when rights and claims and interests intersect or conflict. You know, uh, when you're going down the street and you come to a red light, guess what? Your right to proceed is taken away from you as long as that light is red. And the person who's coming across has the green light, they now have the right to go through. That's how we reconcile the interests of the people on those two roads. We never do it by saying that one or the other of those individuals is not a human being or doesn't possess equal worth and dignity. In law school, we used to say, my right to swing my fist ends where your nose begins. <laughs> And that doesn't mean that I have any less worth and dignity than you, or that I'm not a human being. I've jumped ahead a little bit, but the real question I want to uh, ask you is, is there anything more important than this principle? The recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of peace, justice, sorry, freedom, justice, and peace in the world. Is there anything more important than that? And I have to tell you for myself, there is really nothing more important than that. The whole edifice of our justice system and our democracy rests on this. And it wasn't always so. We have struggled for literally hundreds of years to arrive at this principle. I don't think there's anything more important uh, than it. Uh, but uh, the next question is, is abortion more important than this principle? I don't think so for myself. I don't think abortion is more important than the principle of universal human equality. And that's where the argument really hits the ground. Because I discovered that there are people who believe that 
abortion is more important than this principle. And there are people who believe that abortion absolutely requires us to refuse to recognize the equal worth and dignity of every human being as we are urged to do by the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now, as a lawyer, I happen to know what I just mentioned to you, that recognizing even a child before birth as a human being will not end the abortion debate. It just means that uh, the abortion debate goes on with recognition of the worth, the equal worth and dignity of every human being. But someone will say, well, what if a woman is raped? Should she have an abortion? In other words, if a woman is raped, are her rights more important than the child's rights? Well, that's another question. But the one thing I know for sure is if there is a conflict of rights between two individuals like that, you don't solve it by pretending that one is not a human being. Even, for example, uh, if someone commits a serious crime, we lock them up in prison. We take away their right to freely walk around and take away their rights to do other things. We don't say they're not human beings. In fact, we bend over backwards to try to treat them according to the, their worth and dignity as a human being. When we go to war, we authorize our soldiers to shoot enemy soldiers. But do we say to them, all right, you can treat those enemy soldiers as if uh, they have no worth and dignity whatsoever? Absolutely not. In fact, we bend over backwards to ensure that if an enemy soldier is captured, we recognize the worth and dignity of that human being. So what I'm telling you is that uh, there, is, uh, there are two different issues here. One is whether or not every human being has equal worth and dignity, and the other is, how do we resolve uh, conflicts of rights between people? And the abortion issue belongs in the latter category. And ironically, uh, I'm the first one to say uh, that my motion would not solve the abortion issue. It doesn't answer all of those questions. In fact, a lot of the journalists were very frustrated with me because I refused to talk about abortion. That's not what I was talking about. I'm talking about universal human equality. Much more important than abortion. It's a kind of magical thinking uh, to believe that uh, because you holler the word abortion at me, uh, suddenly my powers of thought are going to go numb. Somehow I will be struck dumb. Somehow I will uh, forget uh, or, or be uh, found cowering in a corner instead of standing up for democratic principles. Now, regrettably, sometimes that word abortion does have that magical effect. It does strike some people dumb. It does draw a veil over their eyes. I'm willing to bet that uh, a large number of the members of parliament who voted against motion 312 didn't even really know what it was about. For all the talking that I did, for all the letters I sent, uh, a lot of them didn't even know. They thought it was about abortion. And you know what? If abortion is the most important thing to you, and if you think that universal human equality threatens abortion, then I suppose when somebody talks about universal human equality, you might think they're talking about abortion. But you know what? Not everybody thinks abortion is the most important principle. Some of us think that democratic principles are more important. So that's kind of the interesting political uh, issue. You know, uh, what's important to you? Well, if abortion is more important, if you're willing to say that in order to protect abortion, we should have a tyranny wherein the state is allowed to falsely designate someone as non-human when we know they're human, well, that's okay. That's your choice. Your abortion is more important to you than avoiding tyranny. You know, I was uh, first uh, alerted to this when some of the opposition members uh, suggested in the course of debate on Motion 312 that uh, the Prime Minister should have a right to veto private members' business like this. You know? Now, anywhere else you go, any other discussion you have about the power of members of Parliament, 
Uh, it's all about how it's shrinking and how we have to expand and protect the power of a member of parliament. But if abortion is more important to you than any other issue, then you're willing to sacrifice the uh, freedom of a member of parliament in the, one of the last few freedoms that a member of parliament has, which is to propose a private member's bill free of any interference from party leaders. If abortion is most important to you more than anything else, then, then of course you're going to try and shut down free speech of anyone who disagrees with you. Because abortion is more important to you than free speech. Now, for someone like me, democratic principles are more important. And, and I'm happy to let people talk as they wish and disagree with me as they wish. But I won't... I won't uh, let them silence me, because as a Democrat, I believe that would be wrong. So that's kind of what it came down to. Now, it might interest you to know that this uh, position, which holds that abortion is more important than democratic principles, is relatively recent. And uh, there are some uh, important uh, people who were uh, vigorous defenders of abortion who didn't accept that it was more important uh, than universal human equality. And I frequently made reference to the first of those, Justice Bertha Wilson, uh, the uh, judge on the Supreme Court of Canada, happened to be a woman, who wrote, in fact, that the decision which was most expansive of abortion rights you know, a Supreme Court decision, every judge or many judges write their own decision. So there were three or four decisions in the Morgenthaler decision in 1988. And she wrote the one which was most supportive of abortion. And here's what she said, the precise point in the development of the fetus at which the state's interest in its protection becomes compelling, I leave to the informed judgment of the legislature, which is in a position to uh, inform itself from all the relevant uh, or to receive guidance on the subject from the relevant disciplines. So she wasn't saying that uh, we should deny the worth and dignity of those children before birth that we recognize to be human. She was saying this is Parliament's job. Now she went on to say something quite fascinating yeah. in the next sentence. It seems to me, however, that it might fall somewhere in the second trimester. This strongly suggests that she would have said, as I do, that the point of birth is entirely the wrong position at which to determine whether someone is worthy of uh, or possesses equal worth and dignity. Now, uh, that in legal terms is obiter. Uh, but uh, if you examine her decision and this paragraph, you will see this is the very same thing that I proposed in Motion 312, that Parliament should inform uh, itself from the relevant disciplines. I didn't even suggest what I thought the answer should be. In fact, I required that the committee that gathered the evidence should not suggest the answer, but should report all the options because my desire was to engage in a democratic, respectful dialogue. But uh, here's something that might surprise you uh, even more. It certainly surprised me, and I regret I didn't discover it until after uh, this gentleman had passed. But uh, even abortion crusader Dr. Henry Morgenthaler himself recognized or expressed the view that the worth and dignity of every human being should be recognized in Canadian law. Now he and I might disagree about when it's possible to uh, conclude that someone is a human being. He concluded, or he thought, that it was not possible to conclude that a child was a human being until uh, after the fifth month of gestation. I might disagree with him about that. But he testified to Parliament in 1967 and this is a direct quote. It seems advisable that a cutoff date for legal abortion should be established after which a viable fetus should be considered as a person having a legal personality and protected by law. In other words, he was willing to accept that at least some children before birth should be given 
legal recognition as possessing the equal worth and dignity that every human being possesses. Now, well, I won't tell you the story I'm going on too long, but I wish I had learned this uh, before uh, Dr. Morgan Teller passed away. Uh, but I didn't, and so I couldn't ask him directly. The reason why abortion champions like Dr. Henry Morgenthaler and someone who could write an expansive decision on abortion like Justice Bertha Wilson affirmed the necessity of granting legal status to children before birth is rooted in the progressive view that the state is not entitled in a civilized democracy to designate any member of the human family as non-human and therefore not possessed of equal worth and dignity. And the irony, my friends, is that the extremist view adopted by the Parliament of Canada in sheltering subsection 223 from even a mere study, that abortion, the extremist view, that abortion is more important than legal recognition of the worth and dignity of every human being uh, was not shared by these uh, people, nor, I think, by most Canadians. Now, I want to uh, conclude shortly, but perhaps I'll take a side trip uh, to mention that this, imp this issue has implications greater than the uh, question of abortion, greater than subsection 223, which deals simply with children before birth. Uh, there is a, uh, a uh, bioethicist from the States by the name of Dr. Peter Singer. And I mentioned earlier his name, I think, and uh, uh, Al you know, Augusta Minerva and Alberta Jubilina, those are the other two. And there are a raft of them. There's at least one at this university I know of who propose that this principle, that it is acceptable for the state to designate as non-human, people we know to be human, should be extended to newborn infants. Now, uh, you have to actually see this yourself to believe it. I thought I was well informed, and uh, I didn't find out about it until uh, uh, some time after I introduced Motion 312. But uh, Google uh, the name Peter Singer, Google the uh, title After Birth Abortion, and you will see that they are quite seriously proposing that newborn infants ought not to be uh, recognized in law as possessing equal worth and dignity as human beings. Their reasoning is along the lines that uh, in order to be human, one must be sentient, and their definition of sentient is to be self-aware. And uh, you, uh, you will know that a, a baby is not self-aware. And in fact, uh, I think Dr. Singer would say that a child actually doesn't become self-aware until about the age of three. There was just an article in the newspaper a few days ago, I think, about Belgium's euthanasia laws. And correct me if I'm wrong, I, I didn't have time to clip it and double check whether I read it rightly. But I thought I heard uh, or read that someone was proposing that if a newborn, inf if the birth of a newborn infant is harmful uh, to parents, uh, then parents should have the right to, to uh, take the life of the child. This is the same principle that a newborn infant ought not to be accorded equal worth and dignity as a human being. Um, could you flip uh, through a few slides here? One more. Yeah, this actually, uh, oh, there's their names. This is their title page in the Journal of Medical Ethics Online, uh, coincidentally published uh, about two or three weeks after I introduced Motion 312. Next slide. This was their conclusion. I'm showing that you this because, to be quite honest with you, if I were you, I wouldn't believe it. Even if I was the one telling me, I had to see it to believe it. If there were um, reasons uh, for having an abortion, and if the moral status of the newborn is the same as uh, that of the infant, which, by the way, is the position they were arguing, and if we've concluded that neither has any moral value, or to substitute the words of the United Nations, any equal worth and dignity, then the same reasons which justify abortion should also justify the killing of the potential person. Note the careful phrasing uh, when it is at the, quote, stage of a newborn. The reason that I'm telling you this is so that you will understand that it is tyranny 
for the state to designate any human being as non-human without regard to their nature as a human being, their actual nature. And the categories of victim are never closed to tyranny. Firmly in the sights, newborn infants. Next, who knows? I, I, you read this, you'll see quite chillingly, uh, they say uh, even if the child is not disabled, they should be able to, be, their life should be forfeit. Uh, and, and it implies that if a child is disabled, well certainly then the child has no equal worth and dignity. Uh, and we have had cases uh, where that has been questioned. Uh, you know, is it okay to take a child's life if the child is disabled? Uh, what if we say that to be sentient is to be human being or vice versa and we look at someone in a coma, clearly they're not sentient. Do they lose their worth and dignity? Or someone with Alzheimer's? The categories of victim are never closed to tyranny. That's why this principle is of such wider and deeper significance than uh, the abortion issue which preoccupied those who opposed what I was suggesting. Now if we could, um, well just a moment, I, in, in order to make this completely clear, I thought to myself, you know, I gotta keep digging deeper. Uh, if, if people don't see the problem with subsection 223 and how it violates this fundamental democratic principle, maybe I've gotta step it back uh, from that another notch and get people to focus on what the problem is with subsection 223, but in its own context. So, if you can go up uh, um, another one, and another one, another one. Um, keep, actually, you're going down. Can you go the other way? Sorry. I want to go back toward the beginning. Keep going. Yep. Another one, and another one. There. I will be uh, proposing this resolution that the Parliament of Canada affirms that every Canadian law must be interpreted in a manner which recognizes in law the equal worth and dignity of everyone who is in fact a human being. I don't see how I could put it any more clearly than that. If anyone was confused because I looked at subsection 223 and said we have to study that because it offends this principle, Let's take it away from subsection 223. Let's just see if we can't agree, everyone, that this is the first principle of Canadian law. Well now, I'm already pretty sure that the Abortion Rights Coalition of Canada won't support this, because I wrote to them some months ago uh, with uh, this idea in slightly different wording, and uh, we had a good little exchange. I must say it was respectful, and. Uh, so on, but uh, ultimately they told me they would not support such a resolution for their own reasons. I have to also uh, put in the proviso that uh, regrettably in the seven years that I will have served as a member of parliament from 2008 to 2015, I was given only one chance uh, to bring a matter of private member's business to a vote. And so I picked what I thought was the most fundamental threat to democracy in Canada today and uh, proposed a, a study of that. I don't have uh, the opportunity to bring another matter to a vote in this parliament. Uh, and uh, so I can only lay this down as a line in the sand, as a standard for people to rally to, to say that there is at least one member of parliament who believes that every human being possesses equal worth and dignity. Not that we all have identical rights, but when we are looking at rights, we start from this position. And maybe, maybe I'm now uh, an idiosyncrasy or an anachronism, uh, maybe because I was raised at such a joyful, optimistic time in our history and I haven't forgotten those lessons, uh, perhaps uh, I am, well I'm not actually, there were 93 members of parliament who agreed with motion 312, so I know I'm not alone. But here's what I want you to do. I want you 
to go out to this community and when you're speaking to your friends and neighbors, bare minimum, if somebody says to you, you know, Woodworth, he's just worried about abortion, you set them straight that this is about something much, much more important. And I hope you'll have understood from what I said. But secondly, I would like you to create uh, some sense of the importance of this issue among Canadians. I think Canadians have to rise up and demand that every member of Parliament must insist that every Canadian law must recognize the equal worth and dignity of everyone who is in fact a human being. We really do get the government we deserve. And if it's not important to Canadians, if I'm that much uh, out of date that Canadians uh, are no longer worried about the tyranny of a state that can falsely designate people as non-human, if I am that far out of line that we have abandoned uh, that uh, fundamental principle of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, well then, I am sorry to say we have a dark future ahead of us in Canada. So I need uh, you to go out and do your best to convince people that this is a highly important issue. And in fact, uh, as was in the title of my remarks tonight, uh, it is the greatest threat to democracy in Canada. And as I said at the outset, it is a more important issue even than the question of abortion. Let me take a side trip to say for those of you who uh, believe abortion is uh, an important uh, principle, let me tell you that you will, if you run into someone who thinks that it's okay to disregard this principle, that it's okay for the state to pretend that someone isn't human when we know they are, you'll never convince them of anything about abortion. So I suggest we start with the uh, first things first. History is on the side of justice and human rights. I firmly believe that. And I firmly believe that history is on the side of this principle. And I therefore believe that uh, we can be optimistic that if we do our jobs, history is on our side. So thank you very much for that opportunity to present these ideas.